GPT 4.5 is here. It's our best chat model yet. Wait, I've heard that before. These are the best iPhones we've ever created. But unlike the iPhone, GPT 4.5 will be the last general model that OpenAI makes. And it's a good time to close this chapter too because the disappointment has been strong. I'm no better. So today we're also going to talk about why GPT 4.5 sucks, but on a technical level. GPT 4.5 proves that bigger models aren't always better models. So we'll discuss why that is, how it was trained, and why it struggled to improve. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Tam and I'm a machine learning engineer. I've worked on projects like the Apple Vision Pro and robotic arms, particularly with a focus on computer vision models. There's so many AI models being released each week now that it's easy to feel overwhelmed. And so I'm using my background as a machine learning engineer to break them down for you so that you can understand them beyond the hype and the headlines. Today's model is GPT 4.5, so let's get into it. So this is what OpenAI gave us as part of the GPT 4.5 release, breadcrumbs. So what I've done is distill the breadcrumbs into a nice cohesive format to make it easier for us to compare GPT 4.5 with the other models, which lays the groundwork for us then to understand why GPT 4.5 wasn't really much better of a model. Now we're going to be hating on GPT 4.5 for the next few minutes, but stick around until the end where I talk about the good things about GPT 4.5. Okay, so in practice, the three stages of an LLM have this approximate distribution here with 96% of the compute spent in pre-training. For discussion purposes, we'll illustrate GPT-40, our previous general model, using this illustration here. Then when reasoning models like O1 and O3 came about, what we see happen is the inference time gets longer because the models are spending more time thinking and reasoning before they give you the answer. A new concept called test time compute becomes popularized. Now with GPT 4.5, we don't extend the inference time with reasoning capabilities, but instead we give pre-training a bunch more compute. So what does that involve? Well, we're now working with a much larger model, more layers, more transformer blocks, more parameters overall. I wouldn't be surprised if the model 10 x or so. A bigger model also means that it's hungrier for more training data. The problem is that the information we have on the internet and the number of books we've published since GPT-40 haven't 10 x correspondingly. So here, I suspect that GPT-4.5 has been trained with a substantial amount of training data to satisfy its hunger. It could be part of the reason why someone from the synthetic team was part of the demo panel because of the role they played in the model's training. That said, just because you can generate synthetic data for the model to train with doesn't mean that it's as good, as nutritious of data as we'll see in a moment. So just keep a mental note on that. Okay, so bigger models and more data means more compute needed to do the training. In fact, the training process had to be distributed across multiple data centers in order to be able to handle the memory load of the model. Fun fact, OpenAI uses Ray for its distributed computing framework. They also have a Ray Summit AI conference where OpenAI comes to speak at every year. And I made a video of it on my experience there if you wanna see what that was like. Lastly, the precision of the floating points were also lowered during training. Like going from floating point 32 to floating point 16 to save on that memory load. It really demonstrates to you how much bigger GPT 4.5 was compared to 4.0 to require all those changes. All these changes is also what makes scalable unsupervised learning possible. Besides making the unsupervised learning more scalable, it doesn't seem like any new unsupervised learning method was developed, just brute forcing more compute re resources on it. What did have new methods is in post-training, where they mentioned that new alignment techniques were developed to enable more EQ and more vibes. And here, synthetic data was also used, generated by a smaller model. And as usual, a mixture of supervised learning and reinforcement learning are used for post-training. Lastly, for inference, GPT 4.5 is a general model, so same as GPT 4.0. So when you run it during test time, the model is solely thinking, not thinking hard, not reasoning, no chain of thought. That said, the bigger the model, the longer the inference time. So to combat that, OpenAI incorporated new inference systems to reduce that latency. And that's an overview of how GPT 4.5 differs from the other models. Now for our next question, if GPT 4.5 got a big compute boost compared to GPT 4.0, why is it not any better or at least noticeably better? Well, I have three technical reasons for you. First is diminishing returns. 
And for that, we'll use this iconic plot that came out when O1 was released. But as a quick recap, we see the linear relationship between the axis on a log scale and the axis on a linear scale. That means if you're following this line, which is also what the neural scaling laws also tell you, for every exponential increase in compute, you'll only get linear increases in accuracy. Bringing it back to GPT 4.5, we talked about how much more compute it's getting, right? So let's make GPT 4.5 this point here and GPT 4.0 this point. This line that they're on isn't perfectly straight. So sometimes you're getting pennies on the dollar, but sometimes you pull the short stick and you get nothing on the dollar. And it seems like GPT 4.5 pulled the short stick. Basically to say that even when you dump a ton more training compute on a model, not only do you suffer from diminishing returns, but you might also just be straight out of luck and get almost no improvements. The second reason, others have also discussed how pre-training has been exhausted now already and we've reached our maximum potential with it. Basically, the other axis of intelligence, reasoning, awaits us. The model needs to swap to reasoning, test time compute, so that it can elevate to the next level of intelligence. OpenAI knows this and that's what they have planned for GPT-5. There's a reason that GPT-4.5 was named 4.5 because these are only incremental changes, no paradigm shifts. In the coming years or weeks at the rate that everything is moving, I wouldn't be surprised if the next generation of models was just toggling between one axis of intelligence to the other and then just making strides with the combination of the two. And hey, maybe even a new axis of intelligence emerges. For the third reason, as these models get bigger and we generate more and more synthetic data to train them with, as I mentioned here and here, we should be wary that the synthetic data does not contribute anything legitimately new, and as a result, they don't actually improve the model's intelligence. Now, don't get me wrong, synthetic data can be curated to modify a model's behavior, like making it safer in its responses or friendlier in its tone, but they're not adding something new, and that's gonna be a limiting issue. Now, why do I say that? Well, taking a look at this paper here, here by Stanford. And as a Berkeley alumni, I'm personally obligated to say Stanford sucks. So here they investigate the impact of using real data and synthetic data and how that impacts the model. They demonstrate two things that one, when you use real data to train your first model and then use that first model to generate synthetic data, and use only the synthetic data to train your second model, and then so on and so forth, basically one new model trained after the other using training data that was generated from the previously trained model. And for each model after the first, it's using only synthetic data. None of the real data is being used. And what we see happen with the models as you progress further and further with that training is that the loss increases. So something about using synthetic data is making the model quality degrade. So basically, if you're training with only synthetic data, the more the derivative the data gets, the worse the model gets, eventually until the model collapses. It's kind of like playing the game telephone. One person tells the next person what the word is without any idea what the first person had said. And the further along you get into the line, the more wrong the word is. And by the end, the word's probably completely wrong. The second thing the paper revealed is that even when you train the second second and third model while retaining the original real data, you can prevent model collapse, which is good. That's why the loss curve is flat here. It doesn't get any worse, it just stays as it is. But the bad news from that is, even though you're feeding the model more data, unless it's more real data, the model will just stay as it is. It has nothing new to learn and the methods haven't gotten any better. And that's what we've seen happen with GPT 4.5. So those are the three reasons why GPT 4.5 is a bigger model, but not necessarily a better model. Diminishing returns, a new axis of intelligence awaits, and the model plateaus with synthetic data. Now, 4.5 isn't all bad. That's why they haven't taken it down yet, yet. So I also want to share some good things about 4.5. For one, this settles the mystery with massive AI models. Now the whole AI community knows that there is such a thing as too much compute. Now they know what doesn't work, which is just as important as knowing what does work and where to focus your attention instead. In OpenAI's defense, they are a company for frontier models. It's meant to push the frontier of things. And one of those things is training compute. So now that it's tried and done, that mystery is settled and we can confidently go into the era of reasoning models or hybrid general and reasoning models like GPT-5 is expected it to be. As for the second good thing, there was a big shift to EQ and vibes with GPT 4.5. Now this is a very subjective
subjective quality and it's not as verifiable as coding and math benchmarks, so it's not as cool in that way. But in the end, I think the larger goal of AI assistants is that they can help us solve problems faster and be our friend too. That's why its behavior has been changed to recognize and validate your feelings rather than giving you a list of problem solving techniques. And there's different ways to give emotional support too, right? Like AI explained had shown in his video when it came to detecting domestic abuse, GPT 4.5 was more validating you and coddling you, whereas Claude was quicker to call you out. In real life speak, this would be an example of a therapist being your echo chamber instead of holding you accountable for real growth. But aside the fact that it could be a better emotional assistant, I'm just gonna use this opportunity to point out that GPT 4.5 was the most expensive model to train while simultaneously being a model that gained EQ and vibes. One could argue that when applied to humans, this showcases that emotional labor is labor. Vibes are valuable. Hey, it wasn't me, the science said it. Thirdly, this has probably been OpenAI's worst launch in a while. This is the least amount of excitement that I've seen for a new model. Maybe this is a consequence of nearly the entire original leadership team having left. A learning lesson that if your team speaks up and expresses their concerns, maybe you should listen to them. Because OpenAI is nothing without its people. Remember that? And finally, Claude seems to be the more favored AI now in terms of personality, safety, and coding capability. This is good because they don't seem to be as problematic of a company with military contracts, secret deals with benchmark developers, and lobbying politicians in Washington DC and Saudi Arabia. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself with all these good things about GPT 4.5. So GPT 4.5 is set to be released to the $20 a month pours next week. I'm one of them. If you are too, do you think you'll be trying out 4.5? Do you care to? What are your vibes on it?